I'd like you to put questions and then we will answer those at the end of the talk. Um, I'd like to introduce our speaker. Our speaker tonight is Mieko Aoki and she has a background in biology, landscape architecture, horticulture, habitat restoration and wildlife rehabilitation. And she is the nursery manager for the Friends of Buford Park and Mount Pisgah, where she works with fellow staff, lots of volunteers and student interns. She has been involved in various aspects of habitat restoration and stewardship in the Willamette Valley for almost 20 years, including design and implementation of restoration projects and planting plans, invasive species removal and management, organizing Native Plant Society of Oregon's Native Gardening Awareness Tours, bird and other wildlife monitoring, wild seed collection, and propagating native plants. So she is one busy lady. Um, so I want to welcome Mieko tonight. It's, it's all yours. OK, thank you, Juliet. Can you hear me OK? Is this, am I loud enough? Yes, I think okay. I, I can hear you fine, yeah. OK, so um, I'd like to thank OSU Extension and the Lane County Master Gardeners for inviting me to share our work with the Friends of Buford Park and Mount Pisgah Native Plant Nursery. Um, if you haven't voted yet, um, you will have a half hour after this talk is done <laughs> to run down to the ballot box and vote yes on measure 20-319 to support Lane County uh, 4-H and OSU extension programs. So just a little plug there. Um, so I will refer to us as the friends throughout, throughout this presentation. And I'll talk a bit about our history and the Howard Buford Recreation Area Habitat Management Plan to put the role of the nursery into context, describe our conservation target habitats, share some stories and information about the plants that we grow, some of our particular challenges and describe the role our volunteers play in day-to-day -day operations and how you can get involved. So, the, for those of you who are not familiar with our organization, we are a nonprofit founded in 1989 that works to protect and enhance native ecosystems and compatible recreation in the Mount Pisgah area. I'll explain a bit more about that, but first I want to acknowledge that the land on which we work is indigenous Kalapuya land. The Kalapuyan people were stewards here for thousands of years before they were forcibly removed to reservations away from the Willamette Valley. They are now members of the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ronde Community of Oregon and the Confederated Tribes of Siletz Indians. The Friends are committed to supporting ongoing and renewed indigenous stewardship with all people of the Willamette Valley. This map shows the tribes of Oregon. The numbers represent the tribes, the colors represent the language groups, and the names on the map are the dialects spoken within the groups. The more northern blue area, this is the Kalapuya language group and what is now the Willamette Valley. Unfortunately, many of the local indigenous place names are currently unknown. So this map shows what we currently call the Greater Mount Pisgah area. Pisgah is from Hebrew meaning peak, height, or cliff, and is a biblical reference to Mount Nebo where Moses was allowed to get a glimpse of the promised land. The inset over here shows the patchwork of current land ownership. The majority of the area, 2,200 acres in brick red, is owned by Lane County Parks. This is called the Howard Buford Recreation Area or HBRA or sometimes Buford Park. 
Howard Buford was the Central Lane County Planning Director who advocated for this whole region to be state to be a state park in 1973. Within that 2,200 acres, Mount Pisgah Arboretum, it's this little, if you can see that dashed uh, area, and it's this area here. So within that 2,200 acres, Mount Pisgah Arboretum leases 209 acres from Lane County. The Arboretum is a nonprofit nature education center that cares for the trails and facilities within their footprint and provide learning opportunities for school groups and the broader community. The area in yellow, so this whole piece here, is the Willamette Confluence Preserve owned by the Nature Conservancy. The tan areas, so there's one here and there's one there and this strip here, um, are Oregon State Parks and Turtle Flats, this little brick red piece was owned by Lane County, but now it's owned by the Friends. All of these, are areas in the floodplain between the middle fork of the Willamette, which flows out of Waldo Lake and the coast fork, which comes around this way and flows north from Cottage Grove. And they come together down here, which is um, just upstream from Island Park. And that's why this is called the Willamette Confluence Preserve. This little brown piece down here is 44 acres of former ryegrass field on the north, on the south side of the park along the Coast Fork and owned by Bonneville Power Administration as a mitigation uh, property. And we call it Sorensen, named for the former owners, former landowners. So all together, these lands total over 4,700 acres and host some of the largest patches of rare habitat types in public ownership. So I think most of the people uh, attending this talk are, are from the area, but for a little more context, this map originated in a Rivers to Ridges planning document for Turtle Flats. So here's the state of Oregon down here. And this little tiny piece is the Willamette ecoregion and which is this shape. The yellow is the Willamette Valley. Um, and then this little tiny red dot is where the Howard Buford Recreation Area is, which is this green shape here. And Turtle Flats is that little red dot. Um, so this shows the context where it sits between Springfield and Eugene. So our, um, back to our mission, which is to protect and enhance native ecosystems in the Mount Pisgah area, protecting and enhancing all of these diverse habitats and compatible recreation requires planning and a lot of teamwork with partners. After many years of coordinated effort, the Howard Buford Recreation Area Habitat Management Plan was completed and unanimously adopted by the Lane County Commissioners in December of 2018. This 224 page document provides science based guidance to conserve the park's wildlife and botanical resources. So here's an excerpt from the conservation vision in that document. The Howard Buford Recreation Area will be managed to conserve and restore prairie, prairie, savanna, woodland, forest, and river habitats in ways that support compatible recreational and educational uses described in the HBRA Master Plan. The uplands shall sustain increasingly rare Willamette Valley habitat types, including a mosaic of open prairie, savanna, and oak woodland on sites where these habitats occurred historically. Conifer and mixed forest shall be retained and enhanced in upland portions of HBRA that historically supported forests. 
These native habitats shall conserve common and rare native plants and animals, including federally and state listed threatened and endangered species. Habitat restoration shall provide significant increases in quality and or extent of priority habitat to support a high diversity of wildlife species, which were historically much more prevalent throughout the entire Willamette Valley. Restoration will also lessen the threat of severe wildfire through reduction of dense brushy fuels in prairie, savanna, and oak woodland habitats. So the plan further identifies nine conservation targets. Six are habitats, one is a federally endangered plant, and one is a rare bird, and one is visitor experience. They are upland prairie and savanna, oak woodland, wetland prairie, Bradshaw's Lomatium, Buckbrush Chaparral, Willamette Riparian Systems and Associated Floodplain, Creeks and Streams, Oregon Vesper Sparrow, and Visitor Experience. In the nursery, we grow species that were collected from these conservation habitat types. Seed harvested from the nursery is then used for restoration projects throughout the Mount Pisgah area. So upland prairie is defined as a grass and forb dominated plant community with few to no trees or shrubs occurring on non-hydric soils. Savannah is a community with scattered open grown trees with an understory dominated by grasses and forbs. The primary savannah Tree species is Oregon white oak, but scattered conifers such as ponderosa pine, incense cedar, and Douglas fir may also be present. Canopy cover is generally between 5 and 25 percent, and tree density is typically fewer than seven trees per acre. Upland, can, upland prairie occurs in a mosaic with savanna, and so the two community types are recognized as a combined conservation target in this plan. These are some of the plant species found in upland prairie and savanna habitats that we grow at the nursery. Pictured here are rosy checker mallow, Henderson's shooting star, spring gold, and foothill sedge. I can stay there longer if people are wanting to look at that list. I can come back to it too. So oak woodland is a sparsely treed community dominated by oaks in which tree crowns typically do not touch or form a continuous canopy cover, allowing sunlight to penetrate to the ground. Canopy cover is generally between 25 and 75%. Woodland can be divided into open woodland, seven to 20 trees per acre or closed woodland, 20 to 100 trees per acre. Tree architecture is a mixture of open grown oaks and more vase shaped oaks whose canopies are constrained by nearby trees. Conifers including Douglas fir, ponderosa pine and incense cedar may be associated with oaks. The ground layer of grasses and forbs is broken up by tree shade and or by the presence of dispersed or dense shrubs. Pictured here are Oregon iris nine leaf biscuit root and Pacific hound's tongue. Wet prairie is a grass and forb dominated community with few to no trees or shrubs located on hydric soils that are saturated to the surface during the rainy season and dry in the summer. Here are some of the species found in wet prairies. Pictured here are tufted hair grass, Canada goldenrod, Oregon saxifrage, straight beak buttercup, and blue-eyed grass. Riparian forest areas encompass the land and vegetation adjacent to Willamette River channels, oxbow lakes, alcoves, backwater areas, and sloughs that are influenced by perennial or intermittent water, including periodic flooding during winter storms. Plant communities common within the system include Oregon ash and big leaf maple floodplain forest, black cottonwood bottomwood forest, and willow shrub thickets. Pictured are tall larkspur and fringe cup. Creeks and streams 
These are riparian areas with intermittent flows, typically running from October through early June, originating from the slopes of Mount Pisgah. These areas are characterized as first and second order streams. Those that are first order headwater streams are closely associated with seeps fed by groundwater discharge. Plant communities common within the system include oak woodland, wet prairie, and mixed forest. Pictured here is rosy plectritis. So I'll switch now to talk about the nursery facility and operations. In this aerial view taken around 2014, the built structures starting on the right is the shade house. The white L-shaped building was the, was the seed barn at the time, but now it's the field office. The um, next is the greenhouse. And this little shipping container we call the can is the stewardship tool room. And since this picture was taken, we have some more buildings, um, but we don't have a nice aerial photo of that. So um, the location and footprint of the nursery has evolved and changed over time. In the late nineties, Friends board members began propagating native plant, near, native plant materials in their own yards from seed and plant salvage from the park. A small nursery was then established in the yard of the Kinzel House on the, in the North Bottomlands. And in this series of Google Earth photos, there was no nursery in 2000, between 2000 and 2005. In 2003, the Friends broke ground on a one acre site where the first beds were established. A number of building, the nursery buildings were constructed as mentioned earlier in, in 2013, there was a major expansion, doubling the production area, including larger plots. While not visible in the 2019 image, um, this last winter, we expanded again by another half acre and moved the fence south and west. So the current, the nursery currently supports about 120 native plant species in plots ranging in size from 10 feet by 10 feet to our largest in this most recent field I was just talking about. It's almost a quarter acre at 50 feet by 200 feet. The primary functions of the nursery is to provide seed, but we also pot up seedlings and divisions from the plots and offer them for sale to the public, our restoration partners, as well as provide live plant material for our internal projects. <clears throat> so one of the wonderful things about working with living systems is tuning into the different time scales and cycles. Activities vary widely with the seasons at the nursery. In late fall into winter is time to reset any beds, add compost, clean up debris, or remove thatch with flame or clipping and raking. This is time to sow some seeds that require stratification for successful germination. As, as it is a slower time for the plants, it's also a time to catch up on some infrastructure additions and maintenance. This past winter, we embarked on a major project to build a new structure for our seed cooler. Design and construction was carried out by friends volunteers, Barry Gert and Hal Hushbeck. The improvement in the workspace is immense. We, have, we now have a covered protected space that will better accommodate our seed cleaning and other operations year round. Late winter into spring, we're salvaging plant materials and potting up plants for the spring plant sale, as well as providing material for the stewardship crew to plant out in restoration projects. The nursery is its most colorful and humming in spring and we're busy potting up material, filling spring plant sale orders and keeping up with all the weeding. Late spring into summer is full tilt seed harvest and cleaning. Seed harvest begins in late April with the earliest species such as prairie wood rush, western bleeding heart and tall larkspur. 
and continues into September with Douglas Aster and Canada Goldenrod. Each species has its own life strategy and our challenge as growers is to find that balance between maximizing yield and minimizing inputs. Many of our native plants do not ripen all at once. Some we harvest daily as they ripen and others we cut down all at once when the majority is ripe. We also grow some species in holes and cut in the landscape fabric to catch the seed from those that either shatter or fling their seeds and we can vacuum them up afterwards. We even vacuum seeds right off the plants in some cases, such as with fireweed, as the seeds are tiny and easily float away when touched. The fluff or pappus attached to the seed is caught and collected on the vacuum filter. Some of the seeds fall into the bottom but are still attached to the pappus and will need to be removed. There are benefits and drawbacks to vacuuming as it may save time on harvesting, but increase the time spent cleaning the seeds since we vacuum up dirt and gravel as well. The seed cleaning process has several steps that vary again by species, but generally the harvested material is left to dry either on a tarp or in our greenhouse which is converted from a seedling growing space in fall and winter to a seed drying room in summer. <clears throat> These piles must be agitated and, agitated and threshed daily to encourage the seeds to be released. This is done with pitchforks on a tarp for the larger volumes of material. Some species we clean by hand, either because they're more fragile or we have smaller quantities. For larger volumes or species that are less delicate, we run them through a chipper shredder to break the seed free from stems. The material is then sifted through box screens to reduce the volume. We also use a paint stirrer to further release seed from their pods or break up chaff. Once sorted, the seed and chaff is run through one or both of our seed cleaning machines. Material larger than the seed is scalped off with a top screen while material smaller falls through a bottom screen. Vibration or bouncing balls agitate the material and keep it moving while fans blow off the lighter chaff. If all settings are right, you end up with mostly clean seed in the final tray. Some seeds are much easier to clean than others and every year we come up with new innovations for improvement. Once the seed is clean, we weigh, we weigh it, enter the information in our plant database and store the seed in our seed cooler. Keeping seeds stored in cool, dry conditions maintains seed viability for longer periods of time. We use much of the seed on our projects, but also sell to restoration partners throughout the Willamette Valley as well. So I have to talk about weeds. So here's a smattering of non-native species we call weeds. In all seasons, there's weeding to be done. And there's al always a to-do list that's longer than what we can get to. As gardeners, we know that a weed is just a plant growing where we don't want it to. Many of the plants that we grow intentionally are weedy in that they self-sow readily. We find a lot of our species growing too thickly in their beds or in their adjacent paths or across the nursery in a downwind or downstream direction or in the hangout of a snacking rodent. We often pot up these volunteers and either plant them out or sell them at our plant sales. There are also other subtleties among our weeds and crops that add a new dimension to our weeding priority list. In addition to needing to know what our native target seeds look like when they're ready to harvest, it's also, a good, it's also good to know what the weed seeds look like. So one of our non-native weeds is Lismachia, formerly Anagallis arvensis or Scarlet Pimpernel. This is not a species I had previously considered particularly troublesome until it grew in with Epilobium densiflorum or dense flowered willow herb. The slide, this slide shows the seed side by side. 
They're almost identical in size and weight, making it nearly impossible to remove the scarlet pimpernel seed from Epilobium densiflorum seed, as well as Clarkia purpurea and Clarkia amoena. This means we would prioritize seeding, we would prioritize weeding scarlet pimpernel from those beds over weeding it from a bed whose seed is much different in size, either larger or smaller. So now I'd like to go through a few species in more detail. So you may know Dicentra formosa or Western bleeding heart. It's an understory plant found in moist riparian woodlands. It blooms in spring and attracts bumblebees and hummingbirds. Once pollinated, a seed pod develops right through the center of the heart, as you can see in this uh, slide on the right. And it's full of little black seeds. You may notice a little white dot on the seeds, which is called an eliosome, E-L-A-I-O-S-O-M-E, -E, which is a fleshy structure rich in lipids and proteins. These are attractive to ants who carry the eliosome to their nests to feed their larvae, but they don't eat the seed. This way the seed gets dispersed to a new starting place. Seed dispersed by ants is called myrmecochory. I love that, it's a new, new word for me. We harvest this species by plucking the ripe pods by hand and drying them on big screens. This is a, a nice easy seed to clean. It comes out really nice. <clears throat> Aquilegia formosa or western columbine or red columbine can be found in upland prairie, oak woodland or riparian woodland, usually on the edge of woods or where there's dappled sun. This is a favorite of bees of all kinds and hummingbirds as well. In mid spring, the seed pods crack open revealing shiny black seeds within. This is another species we collect progressively as they ripen which is a slow process that takes several weeks of daily harvest before it's done. Romer's fescue is an important upland prairie grass that we use in a lot of our upland seed mixes. It's a fine textured clumping grass with a blue tinge, though it has a variety of colors, especially in its flowering stems from golden to reddish. We have this growing in a 10 by 30 foot plot mixed with a few other species. In 2018, we were also growing a 25 by 175 foot plot, which took the eight people in the photo, photo at upper right a few hours to harvest by hand. That bed has since been converted to Madia elegans, but we're now establishing an even larger field that will take a year or two before it produces a good seed yield. The field was plowed, rototilled, smoothed by dragging pallets behind the tractor. As a former cattle paddock, it was full of baling twine, which was removed both with the tractor and by hand. The wheelbarrow and the right photo shows what that looked like. One section also had a large amount of cobble and volunteers spent several days picking them out, trying to protect the tiller on the tractor from hitting big rocks. We sowed seed with a wheel hoe in late winter and the seeds germinated, but so did the weeds. Volunteers have been spending many hours hoeing between the rows and weeding within the rows between the grass seedlings. The purpose of starting another big field of Romer's fescue is that we'll be needing more seed to sow following our ecological burns. The friends may be burning as many as 150 to 250 acres per year in various habitats in the park. Romer's fescue will be an important component of many of the post-fire seed mixes. Erythranthi gateta, or seat monkey flower, has a very showy snapdragon-like yellow flower, attractive to bumblebees. It's found in sunny seeps and springs. 
we have a 10 by 75 foot bed that's a glowing yellow in April and May. It's uh, spectacular right now, just past peak. Um, we grow this in landscape fabric as the seed is minuscule. Once the plants start to turn brown, we cut the whole bed down and pile the material and thresh it daily to release the seed. The fabric is also vacuumed up, vacuumed to pick up any seed that fell before or during harvest. The image of the seed under magnification shows that the seed is smaller than a lot of the particles of soil. The finest green we were able to purchase was 32 by 32, which means there are 32 wires per inch. Last year, we experimented with silkscreen fabric, which removed much more of the fine dirt. And actually, some of those seeds still went through silkscreen fabric. So it's just a tricky one to clean once vacuumed up. Because the seeds are so small and numerous, it drifts around in the wind and rain. In spring, when they're blooming, we play a sort of well, Where's Waldo game where we can find at least one showing up in every other plot in the nursery. I was just doing that today. I think I found one that didn't have one of these growing in it. Oregon geranium is a great garden plant with beautiful pinkish purple flowers. It's perennial with, it, it is perennial with clumps getting a little larger each year. When the flowers are pollinated, the styles elongate to and fuse to form a tube. When ripe, the tube splits into five parts, flinging the seed like a dog tennis ball thrower. This means we need to go out almost daily to catch the seeds before they're catapulted. Another option we tried was to tie these bloom bags, seen in lower right here, over the developing seeds so they can be contained in the bag when they release. This is also really time consuming though. And we were finding many of the seeds were eaten by an unknown insect before they were even ripe. After most of the seeds are ripe, we cut the whole bed down and let them mature on the greenhouse bench under a cover of rime to keep the seed contained. So this is the, the part that splits here and these five seeds will uh, be curled up and flung out, which is how it disperses itself. So Plagiobothrys figuratus or fragrant pop popcorn flower is another vernal pool species. It's in the Boraginaceae family related to forget-me-nots. You might recognize this little unfurling helicoid syme. Um, in its habitat, it lights up a vernal pool with its showy white blossoms. True to its name, it has a wonderful sweet fragrance. The goldfinches just love these seeds, which is wonderful if you want to attract goldfinches and less wonderful if you want a good seed yield. The seeds are very tiny with an odd shape. We've come to describe as miniature bird craniums. You can see these little funny shapes that looks like a little, little beak. So we have two species of camas that grow in the HBRA. Camassia quamash on the top, or common camas, and Camassia lectlinii, or lectlins camas, or large camas. To tell them apart, there's a few characters to look for. Lectlins camas does tend to be larger, but that's somewhat dependent on growing conditions. Both, see, both species have six tepals, the name for the outer whorl of the flower parts where there's no differentiation between petals and sepals. In these photos, common camas on top shows one tepal pointing down while the rest are sort of arranged up. Lecklin's camas 
a little bit hard to see in this picture, but the flower is radially symmetrical and all tepals are equally spaced. As the flowers age and the fruits develop in common camas, the tepals simply shrivel up. You can see that here. Um, while in Lechlin's chemist, they twist together. They make a little twist. And you can see that in this right here. Um, the flowers of common chemist are also more closely oppressed to the stalk. You can just tell that it has a really different look than the Lechlin's chemist on the bottom. And this is distinguishable even after the flowers are completely withered. And I don't know if you can see this on the slide, if there are um, uh, people, the little thumbnail people pictures, but if you can see this uh, picture on the right, there are two seeds under um, magnification and one is shiny and the other is uh, got little tiny dimples in it, giving it a matte appearance. And so you can tell the seed apart all, as well. The shiny one is common camas and the, the matte one is um, lectilinei. So sometimes inadvertently these get misplaced and there is a way to tell them apart. <laughs> So the nursery by its nature has many species concentrated in a small space, many plant species, which makes it very attractive to various animals. Some of them we welcome more freely than others. We're constantly battling the destruction of California ground squirrels and brush bunnies who nibble or downright destroy whole crops. Various birds have also caused damage as we discovered that spotted toeys have a taste for developing delphinium bulbs. We also have a variety of birds who choose to nest at the nursery, including American robins. I just saw, so this is a nest in um, under cover of one of our tents. And I just saw her returning this week. So that was fun. Um, so American robins kill deer. This is a kill deer nest in the center. They like 360 degree view, so it was completely exposed nest and they successfully raised four chicks. Tree and violet green swallows and house wrens use the nest boxes on the nursery perimeter fence. And the various lumber piles and black plastic fabric seems to be very popular with our Western fence lizards and gopher snakes. And our tarps in winter, in the rainy se season, collect little pockets of water in winter that the Pacific chorus or tree frogs seem to enjoy. And our long, long blooming season attracts myriad pollinators from flies to bees to butterflies and hummingbirds. We were visited by a mini swarm of Ca California tortoiseshell butterflies a few years ago they were drinking water in the damp soil beneath our gravel paths, which was just one of many magical moments. So since the beginning, friends and intern, uh, sorry, since the beginning, volunteers and interns have been an integral part of the friends. We have a full-time staff of eight for the whole organization. Two of us are in the nursery even during COVID in 2020, we had over 10,400 volunteer hours and 6,700 of them in the nursery. So that's like three more full-time people. We simply wouldn't be able to do everything we do without volunteers. So every Tuesday and Thursday morning and the first and third Saturday of the month, we invite volunteers to come and join us in whatever we're working on that day. We do our best to cater to the needs and as we're able from the more vigorous to the detail oriented, standing to crouching to kneeling, highly skilled to no experience needed. 
many of our tasks are obviously plant oriented in nature, including weeding, planting, propagating, seed harvesting and cleaning or washing nursery pots. But we also have opportunities for volunteers to help with other tasks such as equipment maintenance, construction projects, tool sharpening, or providing us with chocolate truffles. As we have a facility for learning, we welcome any of you master gardeners who are looking to fulfill volunteer hours by leading workshops in compost, apple tree pruning, weed identification, taking cuttings for propagation or other options. The nursery has become a marvelous hub of activity supporting a community of plants, wildlife and people, each nurturing the other. After more than a year of many people being isolated due to the COVID-19 pandemic, we're incredibly fortunate that we can provide a place for volunteers to come and learn, teach, connect, and heal. I welcome any of you, any of you to join us. So I'm listing some resources for anyone who'd like to learn more about the Grand Ronde community of Oregon, the Confederated Tribes of Siletz Indians, information on indigenous history and culture from Dr. David G. Lewis, and information on the Kalapuya. In addition, these are the links to the Lane County Parks Master Plan, the HBRA Habitat Management Plan, and the HBRA Master Plan. More information on native plants can be found at Oregon Flora Project, Oregon Native Plant Society of, of Oregon, NPSO, or uh, Emerald Chapter of the NPSO, and Salix and Associates, where Bruce Associates, where Bruce Newhouse has very generously assimilated lots of information with bird, butterfly, and pollinator lists that he shares. And with that, I thank you for your time and interest in the Friends Native Plant Nursery. Feel free to learn more about us at our website or contact me via email, and I welcome any questions that you may have. First, thank you so much, Mako, for that wonderful presentation. I certainly learned a lot, and I'm sure many people that were here did as well. Um, so again, if people have questions, please put them in the Q&A box. Um, I'm sure Mako is very, very interested in getting as many questions as she can. She's a great expert on a lot of native plants, so put those questions in the Q&A box. So I'll oh, turn it over to Sharon. I'm going to take advantage of the fact that other folks will have to take a little time to type. I've got a couple of questions. Okay. <laughs> um, when you were talking about habitats and upland prairie, that to me looks like what you're talking about as the top of Mount Pisgah. And I know that an awful lot of the hills around here are covered in Doug fir. And so I'm wondering, is Mount Pisgah then really the, the habitat that we would have seen in this area when the habitat was um, inhabited by the Kalapuya people with their burning and, and management? Yes, I mean, there, there were, there are some photos um, probably in, um, at the Lane Historical Society and um, other, collections where um, you can see what uh, the some of even like Skinner Butte and um, most of the valley and many of the the buttes were not covered with Douglas fir. There definitely were places where there was some conifer forest but it was much more open than it is now. Um, and um, yeah, that, that's one of the most dramatic changes just vegetatively. Um, also, of course, development and agriculture has, has done a lot of, made a lot of changes, but 
just in terms of um, fire suppression and um, not allowing um, fires to burn more frequently or not setting fires uh, annually or every few years has really changed the, the character. Um, and that's part of the reason that that's one of the most imperiled ecosystems that, yeah. I knew about the native peoples burning the, the valley. I didn't realize that they would have also been burning up in the hills. It sounds like, or would that have been more likely natural fire? Do you know? Um, uh, probably a combination. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, actually, I had a second question, but I'll play fair um, because people have been typing quickly. No. And, um, <laughs> we've got some other questions. Um, so I, I'm not certain. This question came in very early at the beginning, and I don't know if it was directed to you or maybe some one of the other master gardeners, but we have a question. How are Nutka Rose donation cuttings doing? Have, have you been receiving Nutka Rose donations? Uh, no. Okay. Right. <laughs> I think that was intended for someone else. Hopefully we'll get some clarity if I'm wrong. Okay. Um, oh, somebody was very keen on the links that you showed at the end and they'd like to, they'd like to get them again. Um, so they've said, Can you, uh, if you choose them again, I guess, um, people could, Sorry, my dog is also barking. Um, you can do a, a screen capture if people know how to do that. Um, otherwise, Vieco, would it be possible for you to send those to Jet and we'll get them out to people? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, great. Let's do that. All righty then. Um, someone else is having problems with brush rabbits and they would like to know how you trap and relocate the rabbits and other undesirable wildlife. And, and uh, them? that's a um, really good question. Um, that's something that I have struggled with because I am not a fan of killing things. Um, what we've been doing lately is um, screening the more vulnerable plants. And um, so like our uh, delphinium beds, um, last year, almost total destruction by, um, California ground squirrels. They just knocked them over and, and ate lots of both the flowers. And I don't really even know what they were doing because it just looked like they were having a party in there. But this year we put a, um, a three foot, um, chicken wire fence um, and really taut on the bottom. And um, yes, they can climb over them and yes, they can burrow under them, but so far it has slowed them down. They haven't, I think it, it was so easy for them before to just run straight in and run out. And now they have to make more of an effort. So they're still getting in there, but not as badly. Um, as for the rabbit, um, you know, one of the problem or one of the um, conditions in our nursery, I guess, is uh, there are parts, I should go to a slide that shows, um, well, actually this last slide, um, you can see that there's great cover for um, critters all along here and all along here. So they just hide in there and then they run out and eat stuff and run back in. And um, so, and they also run under this building and, and come back out. So one of the things we were doing is trying to block the entrance to underneath some of those places so they're they're more exposed. We've tried putting um, perches up around the perimeter to attract um, raptors. And, um, and I know at night the coyotes probably come around here too, but um, 
Yeah, that little bunny, he's, he's done a lot of damage for us. We have tried live trapping, but um, don't really have a great place to release them. So um, try covering them. If they're grown in the ground, uh, yeah, it's, it's, I don't have a great answer. We are suffering some damage, but try fencing. Alrighty. Thank you. <laughs> um, how many master gardeners are currently out volunteering at your nursery? That's a good question. Um, I don't know. I don't know if we have any, they may not have identified themselves as such. They may be incognito. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, at least not, um, uh, well, in terms of coming out and volunteering at one of our work parties, my understanding is um, that does not get, that does not earn you your Master Gardener volunteer hours. Mm -hmm. So, um, but to do something like lead workshops and that sort of thing, would love to have more master gardeners involved that way. And if anyone is interested, would be, that would be fabulous to do that. So none, I guess, is the answer. <laughs> um, we've got a question. Um, does your nursery have a close association with the MPA? Oh, the Mount Pisgah Arboretum? Oh, yeah. Is that what MPA yeah. is? Um, I think you're yeah, right. the, they just put the abbreviation. Yeah, yeah. Um, the Arboretum, some people don't know that we are separate organizations um, operating in separate parts of the park. The Arboretum does um, focus on uh, nature education. Um, they have that wonderful program for school children. And um, they also have a number of really great workshops and talks and um, they lead tours on uh, bird walks and insect walks and uh, mushroom walks and they they do the wildflower festival they just had their wildflower festival virtual virtually this um, last weekend um, uh, I think the mushroom festival, fingers crossed will be an in-person event again this fall but um uh but they they have a, a separate you know their a program from us we do we do come you know collaborate with them on on some things but they don't have a a nursery that they run so we're the only nursery facility in the park I don't know if that answers that question, but. Yeah, and then, so it sounds like from what you're saying then too, an awful lot of the seeds you're collecting and the plants you're growing are being used uh, for restoration throughout uh, Mount Pisgah. Is that correct? Yes, wow. yeah, yeah. Um, we do have um, an arrangement with uh, an, a grower, um, Pacific Northwest natives who um, they have taken seed that we collected so it's our wild seed um, but they have uh, larger fields and the equipment to harvest and plant and so they um, are able to grow much larger volumes. We're looking at well we're growing this one field um, now we're sort of at this interesting intermediate scale. It's it's a lot bigger than a garden, but much smaller than you know a commercial operation. So we're doing all almost all of the weeding and the harvesting by hand, um, not with tractors or anything. So um, if we do expand to larger fields, we will probably need to invest in or um, make arrangements with partners who have that equipment. So um, 
Pacific Northwest natives were with our seed, we were able to um, provide a lot of seed to <clears throat> folks up the Mackenzie who um, were victims of the holiday farm fire. So we're really glad to be able to do that. Wow. Yeah. I have, I have one question. How do you decide which natives that you decide to plant in the nursery? Yeah, really good question. Um, some of them um, are uh, from salvage opportunities, um, either from trail restoration or trail realignment projects um, where plants are gonna get, um, we can save them from getting Oh, uh, yeah, <laughs> the trail is going to um, uh, obliterate them otherwise. So um, salvage that way. Um, and also um, plants that are representative of those habitat types that we were talking about earlier. Um, things that are interesting uh, to people, um, things that are good, will attract good pollinators, um, species that um, establish well after disturbance, um, things that are reasonably easy to collect, things that we can grow. Um, some, some species are, are really tricky um, or otherwise we're not successful at growing them. Um, I would love to start growing ferns, but we, we haven't started those yet. So I think that was somebody's favorite plant was sword fern and, um, <laughs> But you don't have much shade there, so I don't know how you, do you have an area for shade? We do, I, we set up, um, I don't know if it shows in one of these earlier slides. Um, we do put up a shade structure. Okay. Um, this, this here is um, shade species, and this is where our Delphinium trolifolium are, and that's, also shaded and then this is where our um, container stock is and that's also under shade but you're right it's um it's pretty pretty open sunny spot um which is the right conditions for for most prairie species so mm -hmm. yeah okay well i think we're at 7 30 so um I want to thank you again for being our speaker tonight um, and uh, providing such a wonderful PowerPoint. I thought the PowerPoint was fabulous. You gave us such good insight into what the place looks like, all the different plants that you have there. You did a great job in putting together the PowerPoint. So thank you for that and the time it took to put that together. Um, I just want to mention that our next seminar coming up is going to be June 15th and we'll have um, the topic will be beekeeping. So bees in beekeeping. So uh, join us back in a month for, for that topic. All right. So thank you again. Anything else, Sharon, you have to add or? Uh, no. Um... But thank you. Yeah, we got a, a number of thank yous. Um, that was fascinating. I, I really appreciated your covering your mission, what you're doing. And I had no idea about the variety and, and just the ingenuity that's required in seed harvesting yes. and <laughs> trying to get <laughs> the seed and not the little soil particle. Right. <laughs> Cause you just can't grow anything from plain soil. <laughs> but yeah, that was, that was really fascinating. So. Great. Okay. Well, thank you everyone for joining us and uh, have a good, good night.